speaking about the third installment, which is we're going to talk about the shofar this evening and all of its implications. I'm also hopefully going to be giving you, um, we're going to go through the, the chapter in Tehillim, chapter 47, Kapitel Mem Zion, Lam Natsayach. We're going to go through that with explanations. And I have some amazing thoughts to share with you before Rosh Hashanah about how to approach the whole thing, things we have not yet said that we are going to say now. Okay, so let's first start out with, let's first start out with two quotations that are brought down from some of the Gedole Musser. First one is from Rav Nassim Bachvogel. We're still not on speaker's view, just telling you again, that um, the, uh, the, he brings down a quotation from the Mir Mashkiach, who was Rav Yeruchim Lubavitz, his Rebbe, and he said he brought down from the Medrash, there's a Pasuk in Tehillim which says, Pana el Tfilasa ar ar. Hashem listens to the prayer of the downtrodden. Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, Kal play Doro Samru, She'en lahem lo Navi v'lo Kohen v'lo Beis HaMikdash Yechaper lahem. Rabbi Yitzchak says, this is talking about future generations. When David and Melech composed the prayer for the downtrodden, which is, I, be I believe it's Kuf base, it's 102, that capital of Tehillim, says so he listens to the prayer of the downtrodden. Rav Yitzhak said, there's going to be a time when the Jews won't have a Navi and they won't have a Kohen and not have a base of Migdash to help them atone for their sins. There's only going to be one thing left for them, and that's going to be prayer. They're going to pray on the high holidays, and you're not going to scorn them for that, because it says below vaza es sam, and you're not going to mock their prayers. And and Rav Nassim Bachvogel, whenever he would say this, he would say this before blowing shofar, often in the early days of Lakewood with Rav Aaron Cutler's at Sal. Rav, Rav, Rav Nassim would start crying, and he says, "Look, we have." That means in these days, the high holidays, we have a remnant. It's the closest thing we have to the base of Migdash and the Kohen and the Navi and all those things that we're so accustomed to. They're all present on the high holidays for us. So that's how, that's how important, significant these prayers are on these days. Sifse Chaim brings down something similar, but well worth the listen. And he brings down from, um, okay, one second, let me just get it here. He brings down from Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, who wrote in Or Yisrael, it says, Ha'adam hu b'nei beso ha'tluyim b'sakanag dola. A man and his family, right, I'm sure he means a woman as well, are in tremendous danger. La'es din ha'gadol, before the holy, awesome day of judgment. He ace to kia shofar b'rosh Hashanah. The day of awesome judgment is when the shofar is blown on Rosh Hashanah. Asher ha'adam niskar v'nishpat amasa. A person is remembered at that time and judged for his deeds. And he at that moment resembles the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, when he went into the Holy of Holies. I don't know if you know the whole way it goes. Kids learn this in Mishnayis when they're like, I don't know, eight years old. They learn the Kohen Gadol was not allowed to sleep, I think, for several days before he went in there. And he was warned if there's any sin whatsoever, he could lose his life going in. You're risking your life to go into the Holy of Holies. So, it, like it's, and, and, um, and when this helps you, this whole visualization, Rabbi Sral Salantha says that he's like the coin Gadol and he has to go into the Holy of Holies, which is what he's approaching when he hears the shofar. So the Kohen Gadol was very afraid, lest he sin or stumble in any way. That's how you have to feel. The Talmud said, we can't blow a shofar of a para on Rosh Hashanah. You're not allowed to blow a shofar of a cow on Rosh Hashanah because the, the cow was, it's reminiscent of the Chet HaEgel, the sin of the golden calf. That's why women, by the way, don't wear any gold jewelry on Yom Kippur. But he, the Kohen Gadol only wore white clothes when he went into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. So too is what it's like to daven on Rosh Hashanah when they blow the shofar. Rabbi Yisrael Salantan said it's like the Kohen Gadol going in to the Holy of Holies. That's what he compares it to. And we just mentioned Rabbi Rucham that he mentions 
that it's like the only anything reminiscent of the base of Migdash is Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The Rosh Hashanah specifically by the Kiyah Shofar, that's such a holy time that we have these opportunities. I'm just giving you quotes for now, but we're going to leave off with the quotes for later. We're going to get into our own stuff, but I just feel these are important things to hear and ponder as we approach the Holy Rosh Hashanah, where we said it's a day of mind and life-changing day. Let's first remind ourselves the basic Rambam, famous Rambam that he says in uh, Hilchas Tshuva. He says, very famous about Shofar. Achal Pishet, Kia Shofar, the Rosh Hashanah, Gzeira Sekasuv. Even though blowing the shofar on Rosh Hashanah has to be done just because Hashem said so, Remez Yeshbo, there's a hint alluded to in it because it says, Uri Yesheni Mishinastan, wake up, you slumberers from your sleep, and um, Hakitsumitardamastan. And you people that slumber, wake up from your deep slumber. The Chipsuba Masechem and Duchuva, research your deeds, do some soul searching and see what you're doing wrong. And then chazer b'tshuva, zichro baracham, and remember your creator. That's what the Rambam says. So shofar is supposed to be a wake-up call. We all know that. In fact, Rav, Rav Yudalei Pchasman tells us that when it says we're like asleep and we need the shofar to wake us up, first of all, the word air, to be aroused, to be awakened, ayin resh, is the opposite of ra, resh ayin. People do bad, says Rabbi Hudalai Pchaspin, when people feel like all's good with me, I have nothing to think about, I'm doing fine. In fact, Paro, for example, said, I only sinned by accident once. This is what he said about himself when Moshe tried to get him to let the Jewish people go. Although he had bathed in Jewish babies' bloods and all that kind of stuff, he felt he never sinned maybe once by accident. People that don't do any soul searching, that don't want to grow, that don't think about what they're how they can improve their conduct and their amuna and everything. They feel like there's nothing missing. That is like a sleeping person. So when we hear the shofar, that's supposed to wake us up to remember there's something to do in your life. You have to make some changes. You can't just leave it like that. Rosh Hashanah is a life-changing day. We've mentioned it before, but we will now add on to it. First of all, this is the day that the Akedah was done. It's the day that Yitzchak gave the bracha to his ta- Yaakov. It's the day that Yosef got out of prison. Sarah and Hannah both were pregnant on Rosh Hashanah. We find that the exile in Egypt ended in Rosh Hashanah. They just waited till Pesach till they left. But the exile, this is after the Makos, and the exile ended for them, the slavery. The slavery aspect ended on Rosh Hashanah. So major changes can happen on Rosh Hashanah. Now we're going to speak about the symbolism of the shofar. Since the shofar is such a monumental moment and it, um, you know, it, it wakes us up from our slumber, like what is it about shofar that we have to learn and think about when we hear the shofar? First of all, simple symbolism that Ben Ishchai tells us that the shofar is shaped very narrow at the bottom where you blow and it widens when it comes out. That's to teach us that when we are blowing shofar, this is the idea of a breath. Shem blew the na- into man's nostrils and created, gave us an ashama. That's how Shem gave us an ashama, by blowing into our nostrils. We give back a breath. That's a spiritual thing, a breath. It's also meaning, it's, it's teaching us that when a person blows shofar, they're saying, I want to increase my spirituality. I have a narrow end that I'm blowing into, but I hope, I'm hoping it's going to increase and widen as it comes out, as it, I hope it grows. That's one message to think about when we blow shofar. By the way, by the way, the word shofar is similar to the word le chaper, to improve. Le is to improve yourself. It's been, it's been suggested that names like Saperstein, maybe Saperman, Sapir, are all from the word shofar. It could be maybe some ancestor was a chauffeur maker. Super is probably from that too, because it all means to improve yourself in some way. Now there's several occasions, many occasions, the chauffeur was blown and we're going to analyze them one by one to get an understanding. The first one was the Akeda. The, it wasn't blown, but that's what it's supposed to remind us of because at the Akeda, 
um, Abraham saw a ram and then God said, don't take Yitzhak, take the ram. And then he slaughtered the ram. And that's why we remember the Akedah when we blow the shofar. Another thing we remember by blowing shofar was horns or trumpets or shofros were blown at these occasions. First of all, when the Torah was given, we heard a loud voice of a shofar. It says when, when, um, when there was Yobel, Yobel is the Jubilee year, every 50 years, the land goes back to its original owners and there's a lot of debts that are freed and, and slaves were freed in Yovel. So that was a time of freedom to announce the beginning of Yovel, a shofar was blown. They say by Mashiach's time, a shofar is gonna blow to announce the coming of Mashiach. Shofros were, born, were blown in court cases whenever a based in would assemble, but they're gonna have a court case right now, a based in case, they would blow the shofar. At a coronation of the king, they would have either a shofar or a trumpet. Whenever the Jews went out to war, they blew a shofar. Whenever they traveled, they had a shofar. Um, and also times of joy, simcha. Certain korbanas, when there was certain simchas, they would blow a shofar. So what is the common denominator? Or what lessons can we learn from all these various occasions that the shofar is blown? So let's first deal with the Akedah. Okay, so Rav Yisrael Kinerik Setzal, getting phone calls from all sides of the earth right now. Um, Rav Yisrael Kinerik, the former Rosh of Peekskill, the original, he said, when the Rambam tells us, he doesn't usually use this wording, the Rambam, to say, we do it because we were told to. You say that by any mitzvah. There's a lot of mitzvahs like this. Shatnas is like that. Kosher is like that. It's called a chok. So what's the idea of gezeras akasa? Why are we told here? Why is that so important to announce that? So he says this is very instructive. The idea is like this. Man was created in the image of God. And Hashem blew into his nostrils a part of godliness. Whatever that means, I don't think God has a mouth. For sure he doesn't. But whatever this means that he blew into his nose of neshama, uh, 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 we don't understand that. But we do understand that we have a godliness within us. But after man sinned, after the first sin, all of a sudden, evil is introduced into creation. Man was perfect. He was created on Rosh Hashanah. All was well. All was perfect. He was only driven to serve God. Once he had committed his son sin, he now, the Yetzirah, entered more, it was not an external Yetzirah, it was an internal Yetzirah now, and now he's pushed and pulled in several directions. When we talk about shofar, particularly, it's the bracha lishmoa kol shofar, to hear the voice of the shofar. When we're talking about that, of hearing something, what we mean to say is that hearing is an idea of being obedient. That's really what the shofar is trying to, to introduce to us, to, to have some obedience. In fact, like for example, right before we say Shema, we have a beautiful prayer called Ava Rabba, that you have showed us Hashem great love. And it says, our, our merciful God, Hashem, saying, please let us understand. First we have to hear. Then we'll lil mode, lilamed, lishpor, velasai, silakai. All these things of keeping the Torah have to be preceded with listening. As Rabbi Kinneric mentions, one of the reasons why people fail is because we think our opinion is different than God. It used to be before man sinned, everything he did was according to Hashem's will. Now we've got voices within us sometimes saying other things. So the only way we can come back to the original man, to the way man should be, is by being obedient and by saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to be objective. I'm gonna to listen to what a Rav tells me. I'm gonna to listen to Das Torah. And that way, it's not my opinion. It'll be more God's opinion. We find the brisker Rav, who was known to be very incisive in his thinking, very, very deep thinker, he would never rule halachically for himself. He used to send letters to Rav Yitzhak Ochan Inspector or a telegram, and he said, I don't want any explanations. Just tell me, is it mutter or usser? Just tell me, am I allowed or not allowed? Because he was afraid if he would given reasoning, he would maybe, under, he could blow up anybody's reasoning. He was so brilliant, 
he gets stuck thinking, well, maybe it's this or maybe it's it. He felt, I want to just listen. I want to be obedient. I want to do what I'm supposed to do. I want to subordinate myself to that of the creator. This is very reminiscent of the Akeda, of the sacrifice, the binding of Isaac. Avram Avinu, his whole approach to Judaism was at the age of three, he was a big philosopher. He starts thinking, where did the moon come from? And where did the sun come from? And he's looking and staring and observing and thinking until he comes to the idea that there's a creator. And finally, after all of his many years of thinking and, and willing to go against the tide, he came to the idea of, of monotheism. And then as a reward, Hashem granted him prophecy and Hashem communicated with him. What did Avram believe in? He was spreading to the world the idea that there's one God and he's a merciful God. He spread the idea of kindness. He spread the idea that he didn't believe in human sacrifice. He spread the idea, he was hoping to have progeny that would spread his ideals. When Hashem commanded him, take the son you love the most, take Yitzchak, what happened all of a sudden is that Avraham is going against everything he believes in. He has to just merely be obedient. He was against human sacrifice. Now you have to do human sacrifice. Well, he said, Allah, put him up, uh, raise him up as a sacrifice. He didn't say he's going to be slaughtered. Hashem never told him directly. Hashem kind of like alluded to it. And what happened? We find that it, it ended up that he was, you know, that he was um, indeed put up, that he was, he was put up, but not sacrificed. But in Avram at that moment thought he was giving up everything he believed in. By the way, there are many in the Islamic faith that believe Yishmael was the one that did the Akedah. That's why they're willing to have suicide bombers. That's perhaps why they close up the Yitzhak section of the Maris Machpelah. It's almost never open, maybe one day a year or a few days a year. They feel it was Yishmael that did the Akedah and not Yitzhak. But in any case, when we have blowed the shofar of the Ayal, of the Ram, Avram wanted to concretize it. He says, let me, let me do something to concretize. I'm willing to give my whole, every, my whole life's mission to you, Hashem. And instead he was told, okay, put all your feelings into this ram. So when we blow the shofar, we are supposed to remember that here was a person willing to give up everything and we are his progeny. And we are supposed to be willing to do the same thing that Avram Avinu did. Rav Dessler tells us, you know, in the Shemona Esrei, Many explanations, too bad we can't get through everything, but um, one thing that I wanted to stress that, that, that Rav Dessler tells us, when we say the fact, Eloke Avraham, Eloke Yitzchak, Eloke Yaakov, the God of Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov in Shemona Esrei, why do we attach God's name to the three individuals? In fact, David Amelech wanted to be the fourth, but he was refused because of his slight, tiny sin that he committed with Bathsheba, which was only that he ruled himself without asking Sanhedrin because he did something absolutely right. But that's, that's beside the point. To be mentioned in the Shemona Esrei as our forefathers were, Eloke means the God of justice. That means he okayed these three individuals that every single move they made was just to serve him. There was no self-serving motive in either one of these individuals, which is astounding. Totally astounding. It says in the Gemara, the three forefathers ran before Hashem, so to speak, like horses, like no brains, no nothing. We're just wild animals. Whatever you want us to do, you want to go here? Well, more like a domestic animal. You want us to go this direction? We'll go this way. You want us to go that direction? We'll go that way. This is what our forefathers were. Rabbi Yeruchim Lubavitz itself tells us that the purpose of free will is not to have free will. And he explains it this way. He calls it being a muhrach, which means being forced, obligated to do something. Your mission in life is to feel obligated. Now, how does that jive with happiness and all the other things that we preach that Judaism espouses? Well, the answer is like this. We live with three type of boundaries, three systems going on in our life simultaneously. We all live constantly in a battlefield. We have a line drawn and in that battlefield, we have three territories. We have one territory, which is behind us. That's conquered territory. For example, I don't think anybody listening to this has a question with turning on a light on Shabbos. 
So that's conquered. We, in that regard, are, feel obligated. Like, there's no question. I have to, I can't. I cannot turn on a light. I, mean, I, I don't even feel like it's a, It's not a problem. That's, that's nothing for us. Really, we're supposed to ultimately have all those things on the threshold, but we're still fighting. The battlefield part, the part we're fighting with is things you're struggling with all the time. Whatever it is, you're struggling with a certain thing, and that thing, you have good days, bad days, you're going up and down, that is your battle. That's where you're battling. And then there's certain areas where you see stories of Tzadik and like, I'm not there. I'm not even near there. I can't even imagine myself being there. And we all are different battles for different mitos, let's say. Some people with anger really have no issue and some people have huge issues. Some people are jealous. Some people, everyone's got different things that they're struggling with at different levels, different percentages, but that's what we're doing. But our goal is to make more, to conquer more territory and to have more things that we feel like no brainer. I'm just doing the right thing. I, I'm not, I, I don't have a question in this area. I don't have a, even a tug. I don't have anything pulling me away from doing the right thing. So that's really what the Akeda is supposed to teach us. When we imagine Avram Avinu, when we read these words of the Akeda on Rosh Hashanah, we're supposed to be like our forefathers that, you know, that to, 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 to make ourselves that we are ready to do whatever he wants us to do. This is also an, uh, hinted to in another way in the shofar. It says, when God blew into our nostrils on Hashama, on Rosh Hashanah, we blow back. So it's like, we are giving you everything back that you've given us. Everything we, we hope, that's what we're aspiring for. We're trying to set the bar on Rosh Hashanah. Everything you've blown into us, we hope to blow back to you. And we hope to make ourselves empty. The more empty we are, we say there's no, no other agenda, just you, Hashem. That's how you can accept something. That's how you can, you know, be bound to something, connect to something. You have to leave yourself open to it. Another message with Shofar, so that's the Akedah. And that's what it's teaching us, to be, to feel subordinate to our creator, to feel like we're ready to do, make your will our will, which is Nasa Vanishma. And that's why maybe in the Shofro section of the Amidah, we have the giving of the Torah. That's what is suggested at, to, uh, suggested what is suggested in the Amidah is that a person has to, like giving of the Torah, when we all said, we're willing to do whatever you tell us, that was when they heard the shofar, because that's what the message of shofar is. When we talk about court cases or a war, we have to sometimes wage a war with our Yetzirah or traveling. All these ideas, traveling weakens people, so they feel more uh, subordinate but it's to fight the eight Sahara. I may have mentioned this many a long time ago, but it's worth it to mention it now. Maybe some of you will remember, maybe some of you won't. But Rav Nassim Bachvogel's at South, a famous Mashkir from Lakewood with Rabaran Cutler, who I like to quote for these times. You notice I've been quoting a few times already. He was a very holy man. And he, he said, why is it that when a baby first enters the world and their sibling sees the baby for the first time, if the kid is over, let's say one and a half, the first reaction of the sibling is to wanna to beat their brains out. They wanna hurt them, they wanna hit them. Why is that their initial reaction? And then in general, fighting is a big, big, big thing in the world. I was told in a hockey game, what people consider the ultimate is when the players get into a fight, either a fist fight or a hockey stick brawl, the whole crowd gets to its feet and screams. They're so excited. Wrestling matches, millions of dollars, rest the whole wrestling and boxing industry. And if you think about it as well, almost everything we do is along the lines of challenges. Like let's say, why do people like camping? Camping is wonderful once you sit under the stars and you know watch the beautiful scenery, but you schlep the tent and you either put stakes in the ground or you're, you know, you have to cut wood for the for the fire pit and you have to like, you know, cook up a meal on on a, on on you know on some type of fire in the logs and all that kind of stuff. Or people like challenges, like when they have free time, they're sitting and playing mind word games or they're playing all kinds of games. Why? Because it's a challenge. Why do people like fights and challenges? So Rav Nassim Bachvogel says, really, 
we, we all like fighting because we're here in the world to fight ourselves. We're here in the world to fight our Yetzirah. People don't even know that they've got this thing walking along with them everywhere they go, trying to knock them down and trying to get them to, to fail. And we are here, our mission in life is to try to overcome this side of us that tries to, to, to make us fail. And that's, that's we're supposed to struggle, but it's supposed to be with their Yates of Harris. That's another message of chauffeur. Like it's a battle to remind us there's a battle going on. The third message, of uh, of shofar we talk about mashiach and yovel this is a freedom idea of a canaric so it's all tells us it says in the of rosh hashanah rabbi lazar has the opinion that nisan nigalu avosenu tishrei asidim lahigael we were redeemed in egypt in nisan but according to rabbi lazar we are going to be redeemed in tishrei it says bahaya bayom hafu you talk about shofar gadol. That day is the day of Mashiach. Maybe it's reminiscent with Rosh Hashanah. It has something to do with that month. And he felt that that is alluding to the fact that uh, the Geula will happen in Tishrei. The Maral says, what is the idea of, um, of, of you know, when, why does shofar have to do with um, the Geula, Mashiach, and Yovel, and all these things? He says, that's gather, it's kibbutz galios, when people are all going to come, the ingathering of exiles. The people are going to get together to one place. And one place when there's unity, we feel freed from all other distractions. The idea of being freed in yoga, nobody's not as half a slave and half a Jew, you know, because he's, he's bound by his master. Or Mashiach, people are enslaved to the nations that are dominating us. When we'll be free, we only have Hashem to worry about. And the same thing with Matan Torah, you know, that, that the idea is that we were, we were gathered together and the, the bad was not ruling us. It says we return to the level of Adam before the sin when we received the Torah. So that's the whole idea. That's basic concept of Shofar. Now, let's look at the capital, um, chapter 47, right before Shofar blowing, if you want to look in with me. If you have an art scroll master, it's on page 432, if it's Ashkenaz. Um, okay, so this is, or if you have it to Hillam, it's chapter 47. It starts, Laminatseh, Lipne Korach, Mizmor. So it's interesting, Laminatseh usually means sort of victorious. There's a few Tehillims that start with this preface. This one, um, it could be either. Uh, either uh, victorious, or it could also mean conductor. A menatseach is supposed to be like a conductor of an orchestra. Now, I once heard an orchestra up close, and it was mind-boggling. It was really like, like I went to heaven and stayed there. I, I, somebody gave me once a ticket, a friend of mine and I went, somebody gave me like eight throw tickets to a symphony right before Pesach years ago, someone I talked for conversion. And um, it was astounding and can't even replicate it in any recording known to man. It's so unusual, it's so unbelievable. In any case, the idea here is when we talk about um, Laminatseach, what's the idea of a conductor and how does it have to do with victory? A conductor is taking disparate sounds, all these different instruments and putting it into one is unbelievable. You know, how to be able to put things together. And that's the idea of unity. And that's what we're talking about. And this, this chapter in Tehillim was written by B'nai Korach. Now, these are the few sons of Korach that survived. They, at the last minute, they did Shuba, and they were spared Gehenna of the other 248 people. And in fact, they became the, the forebearers of Shmuel Hanavi. Now, Shmuel Hanavi was considered equal to Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron. It says, Moshe uh, Aaron Kohanav Ushmuel Bekore Shemo Korim El Hashem Bhu Yanem. Shmuel and, and it was equal to Moshe and Aaron in certain respects. And Shmuel was the progeny of Korach. In fact, many Mephorshim say the reason why Korach failed was because he felt that his situation was, he, was, he knew in prophecy was going to beget Shmuel. So he said, I'm equally right to Moshe. I've got progeny that's going to be equal. So he felt he could do what he did. But he, of course, made a huge mistake. 
But why does this have to mention that this is written by B'nai Korah? Of course, when we're going to be blowing shofar and we're talking about um, unity, the theme of unity, here were people on the verge of Gehenna, and just for thinking tshuva, they were spared. So too on Rosh Hashanah, we can be spared all kinds of things if we just do tshuva. That's all we have to do. Now, this is a talk, because the truth is you can't have a king without a nation. Ein melech below am. First, there's a nation, then there's a king. You can't just have a bunch of disparate people and they're going to have a king. So we have to have a nation. We have to have unity in order to deserve having the king. So these people, now they, this is what they say. Kol ha'amim tiku chaf. All the nations either hold hands, shake hands, or clap hands, depending on which parish you're learning. All the nations, now holding hands, Rav Hirsch explains, what's the idea of holding hands? Your hands are the most active part of your body. Like this is where you do positive and concrete activity. Okay, your feet are maybe stronger, but they're more clumsy. Your hands can make artwork. Your hands can make gold, uh, gold uh, shapes. You know, you can do all kinds of technical, detailed work with your hands that you can't do with your feet. So it says, when you give your hand to somebody else, that's why it closes a deal. Even from ancient times, a handshake was everything because giving a hand means I am to some degree giving in to you. I am equating myself with you by holding your hand. Clapping hands means that I'm so joyous. I'm feeling such intense emotion that I'm clapping my hands together. Um, in either case, it denotes unity. And if it's being an individual, it's unity that I feel whole, that everything seems happy and joyous. In the case of other people with me, it means that I am un unified with other people. In any case, that's what it means. Hariu Lashem, Hariu means to call out, or it also means to do a trua, which is like a coronation. Um, you're coronating Hashem, the call re now with great joy. Now, trua usually is, um, could mean a sign of something negative. Usually, trua is like crying. That's what it usually means. It's like nine staccato blasts, whereas shofar, Tekia is usually a happy, straight blast. So how does it jive? The Oriahel tells us that when a person, when a per, that he said if a person would, God forbid, be estranged from their parents, and then all of a sudden, after many years, you know, even for a good reason, and then after many years, they finally unify, there is, they're, they're crying. But the tears can have many reasons. He said people cry out of joy, people cry out of sadness. And he says that nobody that looks at your face can tell why you're crying. But it is possible to have both emotions simultaneously. And that's what it's going to feel like when Mashiach will come. They, everyone's going to hold hands and they're going to be feeling you know, bad for all the things they did wrong, the nations of the world and the Jews probably as well. But they're, at the same time, it's going to be a joy that there's a unification, there's a meaning to their life and... and we're finally seeing the meaning will be revealed. Kishem Elyon Nora, because now, um, okay, um, first it says blow to Elohim, that's the, the attribute of justice with happiness, because you've got both together. Now it says Hashem, which is the attribute of kindness. He's up high and he's awesome. One reason, says the Rashis Chachma, why people fear Hashem is because he, Anyone that's above us, we usually are afraid of. If we have, we're standing in a valley and there's a guy with a gun standing up on a mountain, it is a little bit fearful if you don't know if he'll shoot at you or automatically he's got a vantage point over you. So even more, if Hashem is above all of us, then he, it makes him awesome. Melch gadol al kol and he's very great in all the, the, the land, meaning he sees everything. That's another reason to fear Hashem because not only is he above us, but he has... He's involved with all of our even most mundane actions. Yaber amim tachtenu. He will gather people under us. It's like dever. Um, it's like he's pushing with a strong force. All the nations will be under us, under the Jewish dominion. Well, not under us. It, it's all going to be like not from not from murder or anything, just from, from recognition. Um, and that's speaking about their different opinions will be under our feet. Um, means different hashkafas, different philosophies. The Malbim tells us there's two reasons for war. Either, two na other, either nations want power from each other 
or nations differ philosophically. And that's the only reason for war. And today, I mean, we see that. <laughs> But the time of Mashiach it will be, all those will be clarified. There'll only be one philosophy that makes sense and only one power that makes sense. So everything else will disintegrate and then they'll be under the rule of Hashem. He's going to choose for us our inheritance. That's speaking about the land of Israel and the base of Megdish. As Gaon Yaakov, the pride of Jacob, Asher Ahav Selah, that Hashem loves forever. Allah Elohim Bistruah, as God rises, when there is blowing. It says in the Gemara and Rosh Hashanah that when the Jews blow shofar to me on Rosh Hashanah, Hashem moves, so to speak, from his throne of justice to his throne of mercy. So according to what we said before, it makes a lot of sense. When we say, Hashem, I'm willing to make your will my will, then Hashem says, okay, then I'll make your will my will. And then he's willing to, you know, he's willing to be merciful. If we are just trying, we would just want to serve him. We just want to subjugate ourselves to him. He will give us what we deserve. So that's what it means. Allah lo kim bistrua. When we, when we, when we make him change his stance by us softening before him. The Shalah Kaddish tells us, now this, I've heard different interpretations on this one, but I am mentioning it. Um, the Shalah Kaddish tells us that Takiya, the three blasts, when you blow a tequila, it's straight, like that, right? So a tequila is a person's on his straight and narrow, could be even sleeping, and he wakes up, and there's nothing to think about, and that's it. Shvarim is groaning three times. That means like a person sinned. He broke it up. He destroyed it. Trua is weeping. You're regretting what you did. You're starting to do tshuva, and that fixes it. And every single time we blow, it always ends with a tequila because Takiya means we're on a new straight and narrow and it's the right way this time. Hashem Bekol Shofar. This is the God of mercy we're talking about because remember he goes from his throne of Elohim Bistrua, he goes from his throne of justice to his of strict justice to his throne of mercy when we blow Shofar, when we blow the Takiya the second time. Zamru Elohim Zameru. Zamer means a song, says Rapersh, without words. Azmira uh, also means, lizmor means to prune. And I don't mean those dried plums. I mean, to prune means to take bushes or grass or whatever it is and to prune it, right? Pruning means to take away all the distraction. You want to grow apples and all these things are growing alongside it. You get rid of the weeds, you get rid of everything. That's pruning. So Zemer, when we sing, when you sing praise to Hashem, you're really focusing on, see, a Jew ends up with praise. Says Rapersh, all other nations they consider religion very solemn and serious, and it means you can't have any happiness. We feel that if you're doing the right thing, that gives you tremendous happiness, and you feel like bursting into song, and because you pruned out all the distractions from what the truth is. Zamru Elokim Zameru, if you're just singing Tashem, Zamru Lamalkenu Zameru, now you made him your king. Um, and then, uh, then we say, because then the God of justice will be the king of the whole land. Zamru Maskil. Anybody that has any type of intelligence will understand after thinking it over, he'll realize that there's a God. Hashem will rule over all the non Jews, all the world, all the nations of the world. Hashem is going to sit on Kisei Kacho on his throne. All the people from the nations, that means there'll be converts that are going to gather together with Eloke Avraham. Avraham was the first person to gather converts. Now, we don't believe that we will accept converts after Mashiach. I don't know what the cutoff point was. I just know years ago, I had a student when it was September 11th. She called me up on the 12th and she said, I'm in the middle of conversion process. Are they still going to accept me? So the base, I asked the base to just to double check for her. And they said, yes, if you're in the process already, you're still... We're still a viable convert. And it says, because Hashem is Bagine Eretz, the people that protect the land, which are the tzaddikim, right now, they're the ones upholding Hashem. But Ma'od Na'alah, when, when the Sheikh will come, both God's attribute of Elohim, which means um, not only justice, it also means Hateva in Gematria. Hateva means nature is when, we don't, when God is hidden, we don't see God. That will be elevated in the time of Mashiach and the miracles will be elevated. It'll be miracles that are higher than those that we know of today or in all time. 
the Mashiach miracles will be higher than any other miracles. I'm just going to conclude with some very relevant thoughts. So don't tune out now because I'm going to hit you with a big one at the end. So get ready. These are some amazing thoughts we have to think about, um, you know, on Rosh Hashanah. Nassim Bachogel just says, Rosh Hashanah is like a war. You can't be broken. You have to keep going, you know, and don't let yourself, no matter what happens, you have to, you have to lose your fear and just keep going. Now, we have to remember one thing that today is the, se the second, this is the last week before Rosh Hashanah. Remember every day atones for all the days of the year, like the today or the Tuesdays. So we're all, if you dive in better this Tuesday, it'll clear up all your Tuesdays in the past year. So if we missed that, then we could start tomorrow, Wednesday, or tonight is already Wednesday. But every time we dive in or bench or say a bracha or do anything, it atones for all those broken prayers and lost prayers and bad kavanas during the year if we just amp up what we're doing. Also, very important idea. Rav Nassim Bachvogel says for 48 hours, we are in the palace of the king. And he tells us when you're in the palace of the king, you can emerge from the lowliness of the year. You're supposed to feel, now this is very high madrega. It's very hard for us. For really the ultimate, if you'd be a big tzaddik, like let's say even in our time, rebellious phase at Sal, they said was davening for Hashem's honor 48 hours straight. That's all he thought about. Kavit Shemayim. They said that Rav Chatzka Lebromsky, when he was doing Korim, when he was falling on his, on his face on, on Rosh Hashanah, they asked him, Rebbe, what were you thinking of when he fell Korim? He said, I'm thinking about Chinah Chatzmai. He was thinking about Jewish organizations. Take, we're supposed to, ultimate. The ultimate is to not think of ourselves for 48 hours. We want Hashem to be Melech. We want every Jew to be a Melech. We're supposed to pray for others. Pray for Am Yisrael. Pray for, for Eretz Yisrael. Pray for any Jew that we can think of, any Jewish organization. And But ourselves is not supposed to be in the picture. This is the day where we're supposed to isolate. Just think about Hashem being your king and how you're willing to give up everything for your king and get yourself out of the picture. That's our goal, that's our mission, that's what we're supposed to strive for on Rosh Hashanah. Now, it's very, very hard. We're not in that Madraga, so most poskim, and I, I forgot where I saw this, I have to look it up again, but most, but all the post -game today, and I, I had a source, but I didn't write this down. They say today we're not on this level. But Nassim Bachogel just lived 50 years ago. But um, we're not on this level to all 48 hours. If you can, you can strive for that. We should strive for that. In fact, it's reflected that way. We barely mention ourselves the whole davening. Only a few places like Avinu Malkeinu maybe, Zachreinu L'chaim, mention, remember us for life. That means spiritual and physical, um, things like that. There's a few mentions of ourselves. Probably the brachas in the morning. Um, he said... Do you know how unimportant you are? If you forget to say Zachreinu L'chaim, you don't repeat Shimon Esrei. You don't go back. He said, the main thing is making a Shem king. And he says, you know how you do it? Look at what you're saying. Just look at the Moxer. He says, this is why men don't even have to learn on Rosh Hashanah. There's a question. If it's a question of a longer Shimon Esrei versus you're going to miss learning Torah, we feel a Trump's Torah on Rosh Hashanah. It's more important for man to dive in with his whole heart than it is from to learn in Rosh Hashanah. They try to fit in learning, of course, but it's almost an entire day spent in prayer. We always learn Torah is more important than prayer. But here, the whole idea is the obedience, the idea of that we're in the king's palace. And if you are accepting the Torah, reaffirming your commitment to your God, that is all included in the Torah. That's what Torah is for. Torah is in order to get closer to Hashem. That's why we're doing it. We want to do his will. So this is what Rosh Hashanah trumps everything. Now, our postcom of today say we are we are going to be thinking about ourselves. So they they give you a, an opening. All the postcom say you could at the end of Shona Esrei, unlike Shabbos. Shabbos is also you're not allowed to have personal requests. Not to have personal requests on Shabbos because it's also a mini day of, of atonement and a closeness to Hashem. So you don't have any personal requests. But on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, you are allowed at the end of the Shona Esrei to pray for all your personal needs. There is a place for it. And even in Avinu Malkeinu and in Zachreinu Lachaim, those are the places. But other than that, Halavai, we should be Zaycha to get better at it, that we should make the day about Hashem because it's his coronation. We, we're recommitting to our relationship with him that we, he is the master and we're his servants. And, and that is really what our Rosh Hashanah is about. 
So let's not forget that important thing and let's not forget the message of Shofar to be willing to give up everything, to willing it's a war and it's a fight with our Yet Sahara and that unity is, is, is simcha, it's happiness. We have the idea in the Torah of Yibum. Yibum is, a lot of Mashiach's uh, background is from Yibum. Why? Yibum is when two people agree to Yibum, what happens is we're told Kabbalistically that a Shama of the child born out of that union is that of the deceased. Like in other words, a man marries his, his brother's wife and the child born is his brother's child, halachically. It, it may even be the neshama of the brother, but it's not his child. It's the brother's child out of Yibum. And he's willing to give that up. That brings Mashiach. That's our whole message of, of Rosh Hashanah. We're willing to give up. Get, let, let's first start with human beings because they're also part of this whole picture. The more we give in to people, the more we show we're giving in to Hashem. I thank you for listening. I wish you all a Shana Tova, a Masuka, a Ksiva, a Chasima Taiva, and only good things. Thank you, Bina, for your self-sacrifice that you really gave in extra struggling for 15 minutes to get us at least on. And we probably lost several people in, our, in the process. I thank you so much, and I thank all of you for listening, and I wish you all a beautiful, wonderful Yantav. Die Gesundheit.